Luke chapter 9, we're going to pick it up where we dropped it off. Verse 27, and depending upon your particular translation, that might show as the beginning of a new paragraph, or it might show as the last sentence in the last paragraph. Now let me say something about that. If you were to look at the existing manuscripts, Greek manuscripts, which are copies of the original manuscripts that the uh, book of Luke was written on, you would find there are no paragraphs. Greek language did not do that, so there was no indication of paragraphs. There were no verses. There were no chapters. In fact, if you look at the Greek manuscripts, you'll find the Koinonia Greek in the way it was written, there's no uppercase and lowercase. So when you read the Bible and you look at a translation, you go, wait, what happened here? They've got it in a different paragraph. Well, that's just the godly people who have translated the scriptures from the Greek and trying to help us understand the meaning, put it in a paragraph, put chapters in verse so we can find things instead of just saying, go to about one third of the way through the gospel of Luke and let's figure out if we can get to the same place right there. But it also means that sometimes you know what, if I were doing it, I would have thought this was should be right here or this should be right there. This particular verse actually is a connecting verse. It does fit with the last paragraph because Jesus has been speaking to the disciples and this is the last part of his quote, but it leads right into the story we're going to read today. And Jesus, at the end of what he had to say, he says, But I tell you truly, there are some standing here who shall not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. Now let's consider a couple of things from this verse. First of all, he says, some of the ones standing right here. So who was standing right there? That would be helpful to know, right? Well, if you flip back, to verse 18 of chapter 9, you find it says, And it happened as he was alone praying, so the multitudes were not all around him, as he was alone praying, his disciples joined him. And they asked who the crowd say that I am. They answered, ah, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, some say one of the old prophets. And he said, But who do you say that I am? And Peter stood up, and he answered, You are the Christ, the Son of God. This is a critical turning point in the gospel story. As you read through the four gospels, you will find that there is, especially in the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the ones who are more historical, a lot of uh, uh, stories and specific facts and things as opposed to John, is historical, absolutely, but not written as a history, but giving us a, a number and a lot of Jesus' teaching. And actually, John's gospel is primarily covering the last week of Jesus' earthly ministry when he walked on this earth. But you find, especially in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, there is this central point. Jesus has been declared as the Messiah by the angels in heaven, by the wise men who come, and by the signs and wonders that he does, and he goes forth, and multitudes start following him, and miracles are happening, and people are going, man, this is so cool, this is awesome, let's, let's follow this guy. And he challenges them sometimes. In the Gospel of John especially, it points out the fact that he says, he starts teaching that they must eat his flesh and drink his blood, and some people went, ew, that's disgusting. And others, the Jews said, that is against everything within our concept of Judaism. Blood, we're not even supposed to get it spilled on us. And now we, you want us to drink your blood? What do you think you're doing? A lot of people left. But multitudes were following still. And Jesus declared himself through all of the works that he did to be the Messiah, the Son of God. But now a very important thing happens. He says to his disciples, the ones closest, the twelve, who do you say that I am? They've seen him for the last year and a half, maybe two years. They've seen all of these indications of who exactly is, but now he asks them, so who do you say that I am? 
Who do the people say that I am? Well, they say this, that, that. Okay, but who do you say that I am? God bless Peter for opening his mouth. This is one of the places where he needed to. And actually, Jesus says in another one of the Gospels that he didn't figure this out on his own. Flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, but my Father is in heaven, he said. When he declared him to be the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And from this point on, Jesus starts teaching them that, okay, now that you know I am the Messiah, I am the one sent, now let me rearrange your thinking on what that means. You think the Messiah is one particular thing. Here are your expectations of the Messiah. And they weren't unreasonable. You know, if you didn't have the New Testament, if you didn't have the Gospel story and all you read was the Old Testament, you might come to the same exact conclusion that the disciples did, that, well, the Messiah, he's the son of David, who was our mighty king and conqueror and established the kingdom militarily and strongly and was a wonderful man and wrote some great songs. And the Messiah is the son of David. That's who he's going to be. He's going to throw off the yoke of oppression from Rome. And man, that's it. And that's what they were expecting. And that made sense. But now Jesus had to rearrange their thinking about who is the Messiah. And he starts doing it right away. He says, okay, now, since you know that I am the Messiah, let me explain what that means. The Son of Man must suffer, be rejected, killed, and rise on the third day. Hmm. Now, it's not recorded in the Gospel of Luke, but in one of the other Gospels, it's recorded that Peter took him aside after he said that, said, no, no, Lord, you've got this wrong. May that never be. You're the Messiah. That stuff doesn't happen to the Messiah. And Jesus rebuked him. Now, as I understand the word rebuke, it means yelled at. I don't want to get yelled at by Jesus. I remember getting yelled at by my dad. That was bad enough. Jesus? And he calls him Satan or adversary. Get thee behind me, Satan. You don't know what you're talking about, he says to Peter, essentially. You're thinking of the things of this world. Brothers and sisters, that's what we do, too. We have expectations we put on Jesus. We have expectations we put on how Jesus should deal with us, how Jesus should take care of things, who Jesus is and what it means to be the Son of God and what it means to be the son or daughter of the Son of God. Sometimes we need to get our thinking rearranged because what Jesus says after he says, well, the Messiah, me, I must suffer, I must be rejected, I must be killed, but I will rise on the third day, which is the part of it they never quite understood until it actually happened. He said, and if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, let him pick up his cross daily and follow me. Now there's an interesting play on words there in my mind. I didn't look into it in the Greek, but in the English, it's an interesting play on words where he says, if anyone desires to come after me, you must follow me. And you could think, oh, well, she's just saying the same thing. But you know what? I think there's a difference there. I think there are a lot of people who would like to come after Jesus. Yeah, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just coming after him. You know, there he is. I'm, I'm, I'm coming after him. I'm going to follow in his footsteps. He paved the way for me he took care of everything so i don't have to go through anything but jesus makes it clear no you must follow me in the way of following a disciple follows a teacher or a leader you got to do the same things and oh by the way if they hated me well they'll hate you if they reject me well they're gonna reject you if they put me to death you know what they might even put you to death too wow what a great thought for the new year. Let's just, man. This is the reality of following Jesus. This is it. We in America have a very comfortable faith. It's very comfortable. If you go to other parts of the world, it's not such a comfortable faith. There are parts of the world where 
people find out you're a Christian, your life is at stake. Seriously. I remember K.P. Yohannan one time talking, uh, and he said he felt humbled by the fact that he, he dealt with uh, so many churches and pastors in India, and he said, and I, I'm with them, and I felt so humbled because I had only been beaten so many times for my faith compared to them. Really? You know, I can't remember once. I can't even remember once. Wow. Wow. There's another thing that Jesus says in this sentence that I kind of scratch my head a little bit on. And that is the fact that he says, some, did you notice that? Some standing here shall not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. Flip that around. Some who are standing here will taste death before they see the kingdom of God. Wow. Interesting. He's talking to the 12, perhaps some others, but definitely the 12 right here. Okay, was he singling out Judas here? I don't think so. Because the next story tells us the three who got to see the kingdom of God. Follow along. Verse 28. Now it came to pass about eight days after these sayings, about a week later, that he took Peter, John, and James and went up onto the mountain to pray. And as he prayed, the appearance of his face was altered, and his robe became white and glistening. And behold, two men talked with him, who were Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his decease, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. But Peter and those with him were heavy with sleep. And when they were fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. And then it happened as they were parting from him that Peter said to Jesus, Master, it's good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Not knowing what he said, and one of the other Gospels says, not knowing what he should say. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were fearful as they entered the cloud. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son, hear him. When the voice had ceased, Jesus was found alone. But they kept quiet and told no one in those days any of the things that they had seen. And in fact, in the other Gospels, it tells us Jesus told them not to tell anyone what they had seen. At least there were the three of them, that they could talk about it among themselves. If there had only been one of them, I think, the, I think it would have gotten out. Because, you know, how could you hold that in? How could you hold that in? Peter, James, and John. The crew. Peter, James, and John. Philippians 3.10 says this, and I quoted this earlier. Paul says this, writing from a Roman prison, talking about in Philippians, joyful things, the joy of the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. I tell you again, rejoice in the Lord always, he writes from prison. In Philippians 3.10, he says, Oh, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. It's kind of interesting because if you think about what Peter, James, and John got pulled apart from the others to witness, it kind of lines up with this a little bit, to know him. And I think that's what we're looking at today, that they would know him, really know him, really know who he is. Oh, Peter said, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And then he got to see a little glimpse of what that meant in seeing the glory of of God in the power of his resurrection well certainly they saw him in the power of his resurrection and they also these three uniquely from all the others got to see him walk into the room where Jairus's daughter was I say little girl 
Get up. And see the power of the resurrection in him expressed so that this dead girl rose again. Only the three of them were brought in for that. Hmm. The fellowship of his suffering. Jesus' suffering began privately in the Garden of Gethsemane. After sharing this wonderful Passover meal with his disciples, in which he said, oh man, I have waited so long, I have longed for this time to be able to share this Passover meal with you. And he tells them about the Holy Spirit who is coming. Oh, I know you're bummed out that I keep telling you I'm leaving, I'm leaving. But it's good for you that I go because since I'm leaving, I can send the Holy Spirit who will come and he will give you power after he comes upon you. You'll be my witnesses. That's what he says after being raised. But he says, the Holy Spirit, the helper, your advocate, your, your counselor, he will come, the one who comes up alongside. It's wonderful. All of that. And then they go across the Kidron Valley to the Garden of Gethsemane. And he says, Peter, James, John, come on, why don't you come along with me? My, my soul is troubled deeply. Come and pray with me for a while. And they came and they, they sat down and he said, stay right here. I'm going to go just a little bit farther on. Have you ever prayed with someone who's in such great travail that they don't really want you to see them weeping? I'm not talking about a little, a little tear. I'm not talking about nice little bit of tears. I'm talking about sobbing. I'm talking about that deep groaning of the spirit. I'm talking about that can't quite get your breath in the <gasps> the language of the Bible tells us that was the grief of Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane. It tells us that his anguish was so much that the the blood vessels in his forehead burst so that he was sweating, as it were, drops of blood. That angels came to minister to him, to comfort him. Why did the angels have to come to comfort him? Because well, Peter, James, and John were snoozing. They're over by the other tree and had this great Passover meal, roast lamb. Oh, man, it's so good. A couple cups of wine. And then we walked all the way over here from over in Jerusalem, man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sit here and I'm going to pray with Jesus. I'm going to rest in prayer. Oh, a wonderful rest, Lord. And pretty soon they were asleep. They kept sleeping at the wrong times. Here they were heavy with sleep. Three privilege to be able to see the glory of Jesus revealed before anyone else. Wow, you three, you're my special ones. Now, I know Gail Irwin has a particular understanding of Peter, James, and John. He said they weren't really special in the sense of they were more holy than everyone else, but they were special in that they were the special class that needed some extra remedial work and couldn't be out of his sight for too long at any one time. Maybe. But either way, they got to see some amazing stuff. So here, the transfiguration, they're heavy with sleep. Well, come on. They started out at Caesarea Philippi and then climbed into the mountains. It's steep. It's rocky, lots of caves. It's tough going. You get up there, sit down. Oh, yeah, man, that was tough. And Jesus says, okay, now we're going to pray. We came up here to pray. Right, Lord, I'm praying with you. Let me tell you something, give you a piece of advice. There's a time to pray, and there's a time to watch and pray. Did you know you can pray with your eyes open? You don't have to close your eyes. And sometimes I have found it's very important for me to watch and pray because if I close my eyes and pray, I am blessed with the ability to fall asleep, 
just about anywhere at any time. So there's a time to watch and pray. In the garden they fell asleep. In the boat, in the storm, who was sleeping? Jesus was sleeping, and the disciples were crying out, thinking they're about to die. They should have been sleeping with Jesus. If Jesus is at rest and sleeping, so should they, so should we. If the Lord is not in a big fuss about what's going on, why are we sometimes, right? They just were sleeping at all the wrong times. And this was one of them. So they wake up. It says they were heavy with sleep, and finally they wake up. And what do they see? They see Jesus in his glory. The, the wording there, it says that the appearance of his face was altered. In the, in the other translations, it says transfigured or metamorphosis, changed. And his robe became white and glistening. And that word glistening, the, the sense of it is that there are, there are lightning bolts coming out of it or rays of light shooting out of it. Right? Amazing. Amazing. Keep your finger right here and turn to the book of Revelation, chapter 1. Revelation, chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1, I'm going to start reading at verse 9. I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was on the island that is called Patmos, Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Patmos was a rocky, small island used as a prison colony. John was probably there as a prisoner or may have been there ministering to the prisoners. Either way, it was not a vacation spot. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet saying, I am the alpha and the omega, the first and the last. What you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia. And then he names the seven cities where these churches are. And in verse 12, it says, then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me and having turned, I saw seven gold lampstands, and in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet and girded about the chest with a golden band. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as, it refined, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice is the sound of many waters." And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. He laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid, I am the first and the last. And then it goes on from there. This is Jesus. This is Jesus who he sees, who speaks to him. And in all that he says right here, it's clear that this is Jesus who is speaking to him. But now he sees him in his glory once again. John got to see it twice. Peter and James were gone by this time. John had lived to a very old age. He got to see the glory of the kingdom of God twice before he tasted of death. Pretty awesome. But you see the same thing in the sense of his countenance. His, his whole being was like the sun shining in its strength. Now right now we haven't seen the sun too much. We've actually seen it more than typically at this time of year. Believe it or not, every day it's here a little bit longer because we're on the other side of the solstice. Awesome. Heading towards spring equinox. Can't wait. But we're going to have some gray skies until then. But if you can imagine the sunniest day you can think of, the sunniest day, right? 
mm, you can just feel that warmth. Maybe you're on a beach somewhere. Maybe you're in Hawaii or Florida. Maybe you're actually in Pittsburgh. We do get some sunny days. And you're laying down on the ground. And you're looking up. And you're feeling that warmth of the sun. And you open your eyes. And you try and look at the sun. What did your mom tell you? You'll go blind if you do that. Don't look at the sun. And even if you try, even with sunglasses on, it's like, oh, I can't look at this. That's what John is trying to communicate to us. The glory of God. It's like the sun shining in all of its brilliance. That's what Peter, James, and John saw when they woke up. How'd you like to wake up from that? What, am I, am I dreaming or what? No, no, there's Jesus, and he's glowing. Wow. And there's two guys that are glowing right next to him. Oh, that's Moses and Elijah. How did they know? Did Jesus go, hey, guys, let me introduce you to my two buddies here. This is Mo. This is Elijah. No, no indication there, right? No, they knew. They just knew. How? I don't know. But I think we will know. It does say in the scriptures that in the day when we see him face to face, we will know as we are known. So I think in the next age, as we walk through the city of Jerusalem or through the new heaven and new earth, and we bump into somebody and we look at him, we're going to go, hey, you're King David. Man, let's talk. You won't have to be introduced and someone say, that's David, or we'll all have name tags. Hi, I'm David, <laughs> right? No, I think we will know. But that's just me. That's just me. But why Moses and Elijah? Why Moses and Elijah? Well, to a Jew, and all of the people involved in this story are Jews, to the Jew, Moses was the personification of the law. And Elijah was the personification of the prophets. The law and the prophets. Moses led the nation of Israel out of slavery and gave the nation, the law. Certainly he received it from the Lord, and that which he received from the Lord, he gave to them. But it was God that gave them manna in the wilderness, right? Jesus said that. Remember the Jews said to him, hey, why don't you do something like, you know, Moses gave us manna out in the wilderness, and Jesus said, no, he didn't. My Father in heaven gave you that. He gave them the law, but the law could not change them, but only identify what needed to be changed. The instructor, the law. Elijah led Israel to abandon false gods. Remember last week we talked about Elijah and the prophets of Baal. Hey, if Baal's God, let's follow him. If the Lord is God, let's follow him. But let's, let's find out. Let's put a little test before them. And God showed himself. <coughs> So he led Israel to abandon false gods. He laid a clear indication who is God and who is not before them. But they didn't abandon the false gods entirely. Oh, yeah, they got rid of 400 prophets of Baal, or 450. There were also 400 prophets of Asherah. That, uh, what happened to them? Well, and there must have been more prophets of Baal, because if you read the story of Elijah, it isn't long before there's another 400 prophets, false prophets, prophesying for Ahab and tell him, yeah, go with Jehoshaphat and go ahead. It'll be great. It'll be great. He could show them the error and contrast that to the truth, but he could not change them. Christian, for your own life, I hope you know that. Knowing right and wrong will only teach you what is right and what is wrong. It will not empower you to do what is right and not do what is wrong. It's just an instructor. The Word of God is powerful and living and sharper than any two-edged sword and able to divide between the bone and the marrow, between the soul and the spirit. But the word on the page can do nothing except identify the truth and instruct you in what is true and what is false. It is the Spirit of God 
infused within his word, using his word, the spirit of God Almighty that gets into your heart and changes you. Pastor, are you saying the word of God is not powerful? No, it is powerful. It's living. It's alive. But why is it living? Because the spirit of God makes it alive. The words on the page don't do anything. I studied this book while I was in college before I was a believer. It didn't change my heart. But when the Spirit of God came in me, and I read this now, well, for 40 years I've been reading it as a believer, and every time I pick it up, it cuts me again. The sword finds another place where the bone and the marrow are mixed together in my mind and my soul and spirit need to be separated so that I understand what is true and what is not. And then, by His grace and power, the Spirit of God enters in and empowers to follow that which is shown to be true. It's living. It's powerful. Don't leave home without it. But don't let it just be an instruction manual, a book, a book I study. I've memorized all the books of the Bible. How many were here for uh, Christmas Eve? Was that awesome or what? When Faden, how old is Faden? Nine. Nine-year-old boy stood up here and recited 19 or so, 15, 12, something like that, verses from the Gospel of Luke without stumbling, without kind of going, without skipping any part of it. And spoke it from his heart. Wonderful. To memorize the word of God is an awesome thing to do. I still to this day, back in 1977, is when I took a class at Central Bible College in Springfield, Missouri, called New Testament. And the instructor, Terry Lewis, made us every week memorize between five and ten verses from the New Testament. We all had index cards, and you had to write out the, the, um, uh, the Scripture passage, the Scripture verse, on the index card and the reference, and then on the back of it, put the reference, and you had to use those every week. You'd see, you knew everybody as you walked the halls. You knew who was taking New Testament with Brother Lewis. Because they were walking around and at every moment in the day they were pulling out their index cards and going. Ugh. Because when you went to his class, you'd sit down and you didn't know when during the class he might say, hey, Dan, John 3.16. And you had to stand up and say, John 3.16. And say the verse. And John 3.16. And then sit down. You had to know it. You might have a pop quiz. Everybody might have a pop quiz and have to write down all five to ten of the verses. I mean, I'm like, oh, man, what is this? I feel like I'm a little kid again. I was an older student at the time. And uh, I'm thinking, man, I feel like I'm in third grade again. But you know what? I know those verses now. I still quote those verses. I know them. I know them in the old King James because that's what we had to study it in. That's what we had to memorize it in. It's living and it's powerful. It's a great thing to do to memorize scripture but just by knowing the words it will profit you nothing you could speak with the tongue of men and of angels and quote the scripture but if you have not love and if that love is not born in your heart by the spirit of God it profits you nothing it is the spirit of God within us that does that Moses can't save you knowing the prophet can't save you knowing it is Jesus Christ alone. But pastor, I know that already. I'm saved by grace. Right? But do you know that in how you share with other people about Christ? You can't save them. You can't know enough of the Scripture to tell them what is right and wrong to lead them to Christ. You can't show them enough of what is right and what is wrong, what is truth and what is error to lead them to Christ. Are those wrong things to do? Absolutely not. But it is Jesus Christ 
by the Spirit of God who draws us. He drew you. He will draw the ones that you are speaking to and who will save them and change their hearts and continue to work in them. So don't get discouraged. And don't feel like, well, I'm not good enough. I don't know. I, I need to go to Bible college for another four years before I can really go out and share the God. I need to memorize. I, that kid Faden, he knows. I should be able to spout that off before I can share Christ with somebody. No. You have the most powerful thing within you. It's what in the last days they will overcome the beast by. The blood of the Lamb. You are saved by grace through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, lest any man should boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to both will and to work for his good pleasure. I just mixed up a couple other verses, but they're all true. They're all true. That's it. And blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony not the word of Pastor Kevin's testimony. Not the word of Billy Graham's testimony. The word of your testimony. What has God done in your life? How has Jesus Christ revealed himself in you? And if you go, well, I don't know. Well, then let's get working on our testimony. I'm not talking about sitting down and, okay, i got to write up a testimony. Pastor Kevin says I have to have a testimony, so I'm going to write it down. No, I'm talking about get down on your face before God and say, God, change me, move in me, grab hold of me. By your Spirit, overwhelm me and lead me that I might be used of you, that I might know you in the power of your resurrection and the fellowship of your suffering. Peter, James, and John Kept falling asleep. Don't sleep through the important parts and be crying out in the part that doesn't matter. Yeah, the ship might sink. Hallelujah. Take a nap. But in that time when God is showing you his glory, man, be there. Be there. Stay awake. You can walk and pray too if, if that's what's necessary. There's an interesting word here where it says he's talking about his decease that he would accomplish from Jerusalem. The word there in the Greek is actually exodus, which is kind of interesting. Talking about his exit, his exodus. Moses had had an exodus. Elijah had a pretty cool exodus. I mean, he got on a chariot and off he went, right? We're talking about Jesus' exodus from Jerusalem. And Peter says, oh, let's build some tents. Let's, I, don't know, I, I don't know what's going on. It's good that we're here. Why are we here? Why, Jesus, why are we here? Well, okay, it's good because we can build tents. We know how to build tents. We can, we can build a place to keep you here. But that wasn't what it was all about. And the cloud comes down and overshadows them. It's interesting. There are a couple other times that the Gospels recount of the voice from the cloud. One of them you'll find in Luke chapter 3, verses 21 through 22. It says, when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized. And while he prayed, the heaven was open and the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, you are my beloved son. In you I am well pleased. Yeah. Awesome. John 12, 27 through 31, it says, now my soul is troubled. Jesus is speaking. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. That's what he says. Then a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. And the people who stood by heard it and they said, oh, well, it thundered. And others said, well, no, an angel spoke to him. And Jesus answered and said, this voice did not come because of me, but for your sake, in the same way that it came for their sake at the baptism, in the same way that it came for their sake right here. It wasn't so Jesus would, oh, yeah, Whew. Man, I was worried maybe it was just a thundercloud. And I was imagining that Moses and Elijah were here. No, he knew. He knew absolutely it came so that Peter, James, and John would know. This is my beloved son. Hear him. Listen to him. You've listened to Moses and Elijah. You've been instructed that way. They are not wrong. But now hear him. The law came through Moses, but grace and truth have come through Jesus Christ, the Scripture tells us. And Peter remembered this. 
Peter remembered this episode for all of his life. Because as we close, turn to 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 1, and notice what he says here. 2 Peter chapter 1, starting to read at verse 16. And don't go to 1 Peter like I just did. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 16. We did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. Awesome. So we should start climbing mountains and looking for clouds so that we might be able to hear God, right? Wrong. Wrong. Because listen to what he says. And so, we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. And when he's talking about prophecy of Scripture, he's not saying, oh yeah, just the prophetic stuff. He's saying scripture is prophetic. It is the word of God. Prophecy is not just foretelling something that's going to tell that's going to happen. It is declaring God. It is foretelling what God has to say. If you read the prophets, you'll find they spent much less time predicting the future and more time explaining why the future would be like that and why the present is out of whack because of what God is saying. That's the content of prophecy. Prophecy. And in that sense, every word of Scripture is prophecy because it is the Word of God. And in that sense here, we know that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. You can't just make it up. When I was in college and studying this before a believer, I was making it up. I got an A on a paper that I put together and grabbed scripture passages here and there to prove that hell is not eternal. And I was 100% wrong because the scripture clearly says it is eternal and there is that place. I was making my own interpretation because I think, man, it was you in the school that I was in with kind of into this whole kind of liberal idea of things. And, you know, well, God's loving God. He wouldn't send anybody to hell. What kind of bad God would do that. If you believe that, you need to dig into the Scriptures more. God is a God of love and grace and mercy, so much so that He poured out wrath and suffering upon His own Son that was due to us. It isn't just He said, okay, I'll have my son go down there and say, everything's okay, you're okay, I'm okay, everybody's okay, let's just, let's just be okay together. No, there was a price to be paid. And those that don't receive that gift but choose to stand on their own merit will pay that price that is due and will be separated from God for eternity. Oh. No prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Notice that? Remember what I said before about words on the page? There are words on a page made alive by the Holy Spirit. The men who wrote this book were moved upon by the Holy Spirit. They didn't make it up. We don't have the opportunity to make it up. Instead, when we dig into this, when I put together messages for Sunday morning, 
If I do it of my own accord and my private interpretation, you're in trouble and I'm in even bigger trouble. But if in some measure I'm open enough to let the Holy Spirit of God use me to plant a thought here or there from His Word, man, that's, that's a jewel that you can take and that you can receive and hold on to. And that's why I pray, Lord, Your Spirit is here. We are open to Your Spirit. You do what You need to do here. You need... We need You. And whatever You need to do, Lord, do in our midst. We're open to that. When you have that openness to God's Holy Spirit from an honest and pure heart, look out because the ride's going to crank up another couple decibels. And it's wonderful. 2016 stands before us. Lord might come back in 2016. He might not, but he very well might. Let's live like he is. Let's live like he is. Seek him with all of your heart and let him do in you. Don't miss seeing the kingdom. Don't sleep through it. Stay awake. Let's pray. Father in heaven, by your Spirit, seal to our hearts what we need and take the rest of it that I have said and throw it away. Lord, that we're not distracted by words spoken, but we are affected by your word through your Spirit. Lord, I pray for each person here. I pray that you, by your Spirit, would move now and continue to move. Lead, direct, guide, change, comfort, admonish, heal, provide. All of the things that you have promised and all of the things and more that you do. Lord, I pray that you would open the eyes of our understanding to see that it is your hand that is doing all those things and not our own. Lord, be glorified in us and be glorified through us. Lord, we pray just as Jesus prayed. Lord, you be glorified. Move in the hearts and lives here this morning, Lord. As they reach out to you right now and call upon your name. I know that you hear. And your arm is not too short to reach down and touch and move according to your most perfect will. Change us, Lord. And now may the Lord... God Almighty richly bless and keep you. May He make His face shine like the sun upon you. May He lift up His countenance on you and grant you peace each, every day of 2016 and beyond. Through Jesus Christ, who is our Lord and Savior, our Redeemer, and our soon-coming King. Amen and amen. God bless you.